Hi there, and welcome to open class number 99, almost 100. <laughs> Maybe we'll do something special for next week when we, we are in open class 100. But for now, it is 99. And we're going to look at questions from three people, Katie, Jake, and Constantina. Uh, as always, nothing here is medical advice, just general thoughts and comments that I hope will help anyone who tunes in here. Let us actually jump right in without further ado here and look at a question from Katie. Hi, Daniel. I hope you are well. I am. Thank you. I had started to sleep so much better for the last two weeks. However, last night sleep was just not happening to me. I find that as soon as I hit the pillow, your voice with all the facts about sleep and recovery just raced around my mind in order to reassure myself. And I find it difficult to shift the tension to anything else. I decided to pull an all nighter this night as I was getting more and more frustrated in bed and thought this was this would help me to befriend wakefulness. Was this just avoidance of the frustration or was I right to pull the all-nighter and do something I enjoy? Thank you. Katie, uh, thank you for sending this question. And this is um, a very, it's a very common question. Uh, I think it's always helpful to know that uh, what you're experiencing is very, very, very common. In fact, if somebody starts tuning into like my YouTube channel, maybe reads a book or something like that, and starts, you know, sleeping better, and then that's it. Then that would be odd, you know. That, to me, that would signal that this person probably didn't really have what we call insomnia, because insomnia is kind of like a phobia, you know. It's the it's a it's a phobia where the the thing you're afraid of is being awake, right? But my point here is that um, once the brain has started to think that something is dangerous, it takes a while before it's kind of like completely seen that there's no danger here, you're perfectly safe, there's nothing to worry about. So therefore, you know, it is all but unheard of that you don't have this, what I call a speed bump, where you're like, you're starting to learn, you're like, oh, there's nothing to be afraid of, there's a little bit of excitement, you learn even more things, you start sleeping better. And there's, uh, you know, it, it's very nice, but there's a little bit of kind of anticipation there too. Uh, is this too good to be true? What's like, could there really be, could this really be like the way things are gonna be right now? And then the fear is back, and then and then you don't sleep much for one night or something like that. Completely normal and expected. And now, um, before I, I tend to get a little wordy, so I'll try to actually just get like at least start off by just trying to answer the question, which is when I was tr when I, when I decided to just pull an all nighter, was that befriending wakefulness or was it kind of like trying to escape the thing that I fear? Well, it really depends on the intent. So um, one thing that I actually need to clarify as we kind of as I develop this teaching of befriending wakefulness is that yes, befriending wakefulness is a, is is a way of like teaching the brain that there's nothing to be afraid of by doing something that you like to do when you're awake at night. But you know the the most common like uh, kind of pushback I get, if not for a better word, is people say, "But I'm so tired. I, I really just want to sleep." there's nothing I enjoy doing at night. Well, the point is actually not necessarily to like it or enjoy it. The point is to teach the brain that there's no, nothing to be afraid of. So when you do something at night that basically just teaches the brain that you are safe, you are safe. There's, there, you're safe in this moment when you wake at night. That is befriending wakefulness. When you're when you're doing something to teach the brain that this is not good, I don't want to be awake, I don't want this to happen, then that's the opposite, right? And so if you are up all night to be so that you're like, um, uh, I'm not going to let this happen to me, I'm going to be up all night, I'm going to kind of force myself to stay up all night so that I become really, really tired and sleepy, so I sleep next night, that's not befriending wakefulness, that's sort of like trying to escape. But on the other hand, if you're like, um, I'm probably not going to sleep that much, so I might, as, I might as well be up tonight and do something that I like to do uh, so that I become more comfortable being awake and I teach the brain that there's no danger. That is befriending wakefulness. And it wasn't entirely clear uh, looking at this message what it was, like where, what, where, what's, where's your intent, but the intent is what matters again. And um, I think, but there were some other things that I thought I wanted to comment on, which was this one, which is a common one. Um, as soon as my head is the pillow, your voice with all the facts uh, race around my mind in order to reassure myself. 
and I find it difficult to shift attention to anything else. This I think is a very important one because naturally when you have these thoughts like what if I can't sleep but Daniel said this but what if this happens then it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant to have those thoughts because those thoughts are basically like warning thoughts from the brain and they produce anxiety. So naturally you want to reassure yourself. You want these thoughts to stop. So oftentimes you can you can think of something that I said or something that you heard, something like, uh, you know, um, it's not it's not dangerous to be awake. You, you can be like, it's not dangerous to wake. It's not dangerous to be awake. It's not dangerous to wake. And try to like make the make the thoughts go away to reassure yourself, make these thoughts stop. And that's why that's when they become really sticky. So even though the teaching is very sound, like it's not dangerous to be awake, when you sort of use the teaching to try to stop these thoughts in your mind, to try to reassure yourself, try to calm your brain down or something like that, then the opposite will happen. So if you find yourself like you're awake at night and you sense that you're a little bit hyper aroused, a little bit anxious, and these kind of warning thoughts pop up, you can actually, it's perfectly fine to just be like, hey, uh, kind of dismiss them. You know, it's perfectly fine to be awake and just like, you don't have to tell me this brain, go away. And, and if that leads to kind of like, you know, you feel good and you sleep well, that's, that's perfect. But if, if you, if, if sort of like saying that one time it doesn't really lead to anything except that these thoughts come back and maybe even louder, then then you 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 you're kind of in this kind of fight with your brain, right? And whenever you try to try to stop it, forcefully try to stop it from saying things, when you're forcefully trying to reassure yourself, then there will be some more struggle. So when that happens, it is best actually to to just tune in, to just listen to what the brain has to say. And even if it's unpleasant, you can you know, listen to what it says or write it down or, um, or like you said, distract yourself, do something you like, read a book or watch on TV or whatever. But again, if it feels like you're kind of forcing yourself to read a book to can, uh, in a forceful way, like distract yourself, then again, you're sort of arguing with the brain here. And it's, it's, it's sometimes better to just listen and tune in to what it has to say when the brain realizes that you're listening and it doesn't have to warn you because you are taking note of what it's saying, then um, it sees less and less need to warn you, which is which is pleasant. So, uh, Kitty, I hope this helped and uh, let us know how things go. You know, any follow up questions, just um, just let us know. And now Jake has a question. He says, hi, Daniel. Last night raised a few questions. Firstly, can I develop chronic insomnia after one bad night? seem to think my sleep is balanced on a knife edge. One bad night could sway the balance and lead to a life of chronic insomnia. I hope this isn't true. Last night, I woke uh, after a few hours and was in and out of sleep all night after that. This has knocked my confidence, to be honest. I just seek reassurance that one bad night can't turn into chronic insomnia. Thank you for all the work you do. Um, absolutely, Jake. Thanks for being here. Um, have a nice heart here. Thank you. Thanks for the support. Uh, so, um, here's the thing, um, many people have trouble sleeping after a particular event and that could be all kinds of things. It could be that the, their, uh, co-worker was throwing up and it was in the evening, they were working night shift and they, and they tried to help their coworker and they were up all night. And after that, they have to, well, another person they started taking medication. Another person, they, they came off the medication. Another person was in an accident. The other person had this and that. It could be one event that leads to trouble sleeping. And now the, the important thing here is that whatever the event was is actually of no importance whatsoever. It's always how we respond to that event that matters because sleep by its own, like left to its own devices, the you know, sleep just happens. You know, the, 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 body, the body brain just takes care of it. It's when we start kind of, manipulating and trying to fix it and tweak it and, and change things and project, project and forecast, that's when we um, get into some more trouble. So the question here is, can one night of insomnia lead to chronic insomnia? If you have one night of little sleep and you start really like trying to fix it, right? Uh, you start Googling and researching and you try all these things and you get into the rabbit hole, then of course, like so many other things, one night of a little sleep can lead to a lot of struggle. But it has nothing to do with that one night. It's the response to it that matters. And so uh, similarly, if you have one night of a little sleep and you, um, you know, you de deploy what you learned, et cetera, then it become, becomes self-limiting. So now the other part of here was the confidence. 
And I think this is super important. So we should definitely stay on this topic for a little bit. There are two types of confidence. One is the confidence that I know that nothing is wrong with me. I know that uh, insomnia is a type of anxiety, it comes from fear. I know there's no, no problem with me, no kind of tr neurotransmitter problem, no sleep switch problem, my brain is fine. That type of confidence, knowing that there's nothing wrong with you, I think is helpful. I think that that type of confidence is helpful. Now, what can be really confusing though, is that when you look at other people who have no trouble sleeping, you, you can think that they sleep well because they have confidence, you know? They go to bed and be like, yeah, I can sleep, no problem, they sleep. And then next night again, yeah, I got this, comp I got this, I got this. <laughs> but they don't, you know? When people sleep well, it is because they have no relationship with sleep whatsoever, right? It's not little confidence, good relationship, poor relationship, like that, it's not a thing. It's just like, there is no confidence, there's nothing, it's just like breathing. It's like, oh, this is an example. You don't say, you know, somebody who's breathing every day is not because they have confidence in their ability to breathe, they just breathe, right? And why this is important is that if you think that you have to build confidence, you have to show yourself that you can make sleep happen on a night to night basis or doing a long stretch, like, and, and sort of like, I'm building my confidence, building my confidence, building my confidence, and then you sleep a little one night, it seems like, oh my gosh, all that confidence was for nothing. It was all like, poof. But the reality is like, when you slept well, it wasn't, it, it wasn't because of any confidence, like that, that type of confidence was just because you were trying less, you were trying less to be confident, if anything, right? So, um, so th this can be a little tricky, but when you understand this, uh, and you, and you, and you don't try to achieve, uh, any type of confidence, apart from knowing that there's nothing wrong with you, when you're not, you're not trying to achieve a confidence to sleep on a night to night basis, then, you know, there's one less goal. One less goal is always good. So I hope this helped, helped Jake and, and, uh, stay in touch. Let me know if there's any follow up to that. Digital Zombie Studios says, is your book also an audiobook? It's not. And it's one of those things that I really, I really know that a lot of people who prefer audiobooks. And uh, at some point, all my books will be, oh, uh, I, I can't actually, I shouldn't say that without being fully committed to, you know, that promise. But I will say this, that I, I really want at least these two books up here, the Set It and Forget It and This Is Nato, to be available for audiobooks. But short answer is no, they're not at this moment. All right, so Constantina uh, and asks the following. Hello, I think I suffer from somniphobia because I have trouble falling asleep, but some days when I'm very tired, I manage to fall asleep right away. I have important exams soon, and my question is, will the lack of sleep influence my grades and studying? Also, can insomnia and somniphobia ever be fixed? Like, can I ever sleep like before? Um, so, Constantina, first thing I want to say that uh, this, this is a very common question. Like, um, a lot of people wonder, like, can I ever? Is, it, is there any hope for me? Is it possible for someone like me to ever sleep well and of course there is of course there's absolutely nothing that stands in your way when you have trouble sleeping except fear you know there's only fear and fear is easily met actually with education i'm not saying that the path to sleeping well is an is an easy path you know it can be bumpy there can be some pain there for sure but it's also not complicated there's nothing complex about it it's just a matter of education and um speaking of which i would say that in this message, I, I don't actually hear anything that uh, sounds like somniphobia. It sounds more like insomnia, what I hear here. Um, somniphobia is when like, I'm afraid of sleeping. I'm afraid of like the process of like, that scares me. And insomnia is like, I'm afraid of being awake. I'm afraid that I will not sleep. But really it doesn't matter because they're both types of fear. And when it comes to fear, again, uh, education is the key. And um, let's see if we can add some kind of like some practical, some practical things here for Constantina or anyone else. Uh, yeah, here's one thing. Um, sometimes when I'm very tired, I manage to fall asleep right away. This is very important. And whenever I hear the word manage or I'm able to or I was able to, then this reveals a way of thinking about sleep that is actually not helpful and that stands in your way. 
when you fall asleep without much struggle, it can later on seem like I was able to do that. I managed to do that. Somehow I could do it that time, which is a very attractive thought for the brain because the brain is looking for ways to control sleep. And when you sleep, it, it, it's like, I managed to do it this time, but how did I manage it? How did I manage it? I have to find out how I did that so I can do it again. Reality is that whenever sleep happens without a struggle, it is because of the absence of effort. You were not trying. You were not managing. If anything, the only thing you managed was your desire to manage. You know, uh, that's just a little pun there. Um, so, so that's important. When you see that uh, my thinking is goal oriented, my thinking is that I think I, I should manage or control my sleep. Then, just that awareness alone can be really eye opening and lead towards like less, less trying, less effort. I have an important exam soon, and my question is, will my slack lack of sleep influence my grades and studying? You know, um, the exams can off is a very common reason for like that extra pressure. And sometimes you can look back uh, uh, historically, and you can see that there have been times in the past where you didn't sleep that much, and you did well on an exam, or when you slept uh, without any struggle, and you did poorly on an exam. And those things show us that sleep very often has not that much impact actually on our performance, you know? Um, and uh, I just had a, <laughs> this is completely anecdotal, but I had a client uh, who like maybe like six weeks ago had a big exam and slept very little uh, the night uh, of the, uh, before the exam and scored like really, really well. I think it was the best in his class or something. Like that. I know it's anecdotal, but I get those stories all the time. So I will definitely say this, that you can have a night where you sleep very little and do really well on an exam. That's helpful to know because there's less, less pressure than to sleep. And with less pressure, sleep happens much easier. So uh, yeah, I think that was actually the questions for today. Um, I hope you will have a, a really nice weekend. Thanks everyone for tuning in. And uh, for anyone who likes the teaching here, but would like some more guidance support on their path towards not struggling, then uh, feel free to check out thesleepcareschool.com to see how you can work with myself. And you can also leave questions there for future um, open classes. So um, yeah, with that said, have a nice weekend and uh, hope to have you back here real soon.